we are going to have a Roger Tomlinson memorial lecture. I am absolutely short of words to say anything about the contribution and relevance of Professor Roger Tomlinson. And that's why I hand over this stage to Professor Joseph Strobel, who would do a bit of justice with that. Professor Joseph. OK, good morning. Uh, I'm very honored, and we are all very fortunate to have Professor Mike Goodchild here with us to headline the Roger Tomlinson Memorial Lecture. Uh, and I'm not spending too much time on going through this authorized CV because then it would take too much time away from the actual lecture we're all looking forward to. Uh, and I'll take my role and give you two more minutes to take your seats and to come here. My good child currently is the Emeritus Professor of Geography at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and now holds the title of a research professor. Uh, he is Distinguished Chair Professor at the Hong Kong Polytechnic uh, and holds a research professor designation at Arizona State University and I could keep going on for a very long time through a list which is honoring but not that entertaining. Let me rather focus uh, on aspects like that, just like Roger, Mike has truly dedicated his life and career to advancing the value and impact of geography in our global society. So it's quite fitting that we today are having the father of geographic information science with us to speak as part of a lecture series named for the father of geographic information systems. So we had some father designation earlier this morning as well. There is Q in this session. Many of us in this room are fully aware of the impact of Professor Goodchild's work and leadership. He's coining the term and intellectual contributions to geographic information science as a discipline, as well as many decades of leadership within the research and academic communities have significantly shaped the science which underpins and enables geospatial technologies, information and services we rely on and benefit from today, as we've heard in the previous plenary as well. Let me just mention the National Center for Geographic Information and Analysis, an independent consortium dedicated to the advancement of basic research and, and education in GI science, and the very fundamental work within the Alexandria Digital Library Initiative, advancing the accessibility and application of maps and related, spatially relevant information. These are just few examples of the significant institutions and initiatives Mike has shaped over the course of his remarkable career. So I'm very honored on behalf of all of us to welcome Professor Goodchild to the podium to present the lecture as we continue to focus on the theme of this conference on geography and humanity. Mike, the audience is yours. Good morning, and uh, I'd like to say a few things about the legacy of Roger Tomlinson, about the man, and about his contributions and the extent to which we still are influenced by his legacy. And this, as Yusuf has said, will to some extent echo what we were saying in the previous session 
about the origins of GNSS. Uh, could you bring up my slides, please? So I've entitled this The Tomlinson Legacy, but I intend to speak about a lot more than Roger and his legacy, but at the same time talk about his contributions. He uh, was a very imposing person. Uh, this picture taken probably around 1965 in front of an IBM 360-65. Some of you in this room may remember that particular generation of machines. And uh, later in life, um, you can see he's a very uh, appealing and in many ways charismatic person. And I'll come back to that theme a little later. Um, I want to say a little bit about his origins because I want to ask the important question, could we have told in his early years how significant a contribution he would have made? What was it about his background? What was it about his nature that allowed him to be so significant? And we might ask the same kind of question about uh, Jack Dangerman. In fact, many people have from time to time. So born in England in November 1933, and unfortunately passed away in 2014, that's eight years ago. All of his university education was in geography, with a little exception in geology. But Roger was certainly a passionate geographer. Uh, it's worth noting, I think, that his interest in geography, in fact, most of his contribution predates the invention of the word geospatial. In fact, he was really quite passionately opposed to using the word geospatial, thinking that geography was perfectly adequate uh, to describe uh, basically what he did. Um, degrees at the University of Nottingham, at McGill University in Canada, and a brief stint as an assistant professor at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. Um, but I think the really significant move, and the one that we can really um, use as the starting point for a remarkable career, was his work in the computer mapping division of uh, Spartan Air Services in Ottawa. Uh, he later, and then we're now talking late, late uh, 70s at this point, he later obtained a PhD, again in geography, from University College London. And this is probably the thing that we most associate with Roger, although I want to uh, modify that view a little bit later. This is his contribution through what became known as the Canada Geographic Information System, tied to the Canada Land Inventory, an inventory of land made in the late 1950s and early 1960s. This was a very remarkable development. CGIS was an incredible achievement at that time when so little of today's computing world actually existed. And I want to point to some of those. So Roger organized a contract to IBM, eventually ran to somewhere around 20 million Canadian dollars. And with the purpose of taking the Canada Land Inventory, which was a set of seven layers of data covering southern areas of Canada, and amounting to s tens of thousands of individual map sheets at a nominal scale of 1 to 50,000. Promises had been made based on these data. Promises to the provinces of Canada that data would be available to them, essentially measuring quantities of land. And Roger had the insight, and this really, I think, was a very remarkable insight, that one could put all of this data into a computer and use the computer to do the measurement. So notice that there was one and only one purpose, which was measuring land area. And the alternatives, of course, at that time would have all been manual. Manual and very tedious and very mind-numbing and very inaccurate. So two basic kinds of questions. How much land do we have of this type? And how much land do we have of that type that is currently of another type? So comparing potential for forestry, as you can see in this uh, map of part of Quebec, uh, comparing forestry to the land, current land use of those areas, estimating amounts of land. What opportunities is Canada missing 
by not using land which is very good for agriculture and instead allowing it to develop into forestry, for example. So a huge amount of data and a massive challenge. And I think we can see something of the challenge if we ask, what were the technical issues at the time? So what were the contributions that allowed this to happen? And here are four. The only medium for data storage at that time was magnetic tape. 2,400 foot, so half a mile of magnetic tape on a reel, which was the only way of storing the data coming from the maps. Um, the maps had to be scanned, creating a raster. There was no scanner at that time for scanning maps, so one had to be built. And it then had to be vectorized, an intensive operation even now, and one given the fact that the computing power of an IBM 360-65 was a fraction of what is in my right-hand pocket right now in my smartphone. And notice the possibility of sliver polygons. Every one of these maps shows every coastline, and yet every version of the coastline is different. So when those coastlines are overlaid, a massive number of sliver polygons emerge, which then swamp the system. So another technical issue. And I want to take you just briefly through what I personally think are two of the most astounding inventions of the geospatial world. The first one is this. This is showing a very simple illustration here of four polygons. Imagine a map of four polygons. And imagine that our task was to measure the areas of those polygons. Intuitively, we might think that the solution lies in digitizing the polygons. The insight that IBM had was that, in fact, a much better solution is to create a database of the common boundaries between the polygons. Major advantage that you only digitize each common boundary once. This is what Roger called topology, and which he regarded as one of the greatest points about GIS. GIS had topology. So just a little illustration here. Um, suppose that one of those polygons is, uh, one of those common boundaries on the left, in the middle of the left, is record number two. And what I've recorded in this data set is it's from node, the vertex that it comes from, the vertex that it goes to, which is vertex number two, the polygon that's on the left, which is polygon number one, and the polygon that's on the right is polygon number two. And it is really counterintuitive that that is the best way of computing the areas of the polygons, and also the best way of overlaying one set of polygons on another set. It's quite different from what you would naturally choose to do. The other one is this, and this addresses the question, if I have half a mile of tape and I have a number of maps to, to lay onto that tape, in what order do I lay them? And you might say the best order would be one which puts neighboring map sheets close together on the tape, so that when I want to analyze, for example, from one map to its neighbors, I don't have to spin all the way through the tape looking for the next map. And the solution to that is this, what we might call the N order, which is illustrated there. Or if you rotate it through 90 degrees, you might want to call that the Z order, which is what typically it's called in computer science. This was invented by an IBM employee called Guy Morton. It's not really an invention because it was well known in mathematics for a long time before that. And it just so happens, somebody pointed out later, that the bottom left corner county in the state of Kansas is actually Morton County. So out of this developed a vision for GIS. And this is a vision which Roger formulated in two conferences which he pulled together with basically no funding in 1970 and 1972 
under the auspices of the International Geographical Union. And this vision essentially said this, and notice how much further this goes than CGIS and how close it comes to how we would still think about GIS. What is our vision? What is GIS? It's a computer application performing a range of functions on geospatial data. It's a global collaboration, and Roger's brilliance, I think, was in pulling together people from all across the world to these conferences, from Australia, from China, from Europe. GIS is an essential tool in planning the use of land. It's integrated with remote sensing, and it's a labor-saving tool in cartography. And if we were to put alongside that what we might call our vision of 2022, which we might call geospatial infrastructure rather than GIS, there's basically nothing in the, 19, in the 2022 list that conflicts with anything Roger visioned, envisioned in 1917, 1972. So this is one of my points here, that Roger invented GIS and his vision essentially is still the vision of a large proportion of all activity in the geospatial world. We have not really disrupted that vision from the early 1970s. This left Roger really uh, at a crossroads because he had little funding. He had a partially completed PhD. What was he going to do? The Canada Geographic Information System was done. And he turned, as one might, to consulting. And he recruited me in 1974 to join him. And I was very happy to do that because as an assistant professor with a growing family and a mortgage, I was very attracted to the idea of consulting. But I asked myself the question, what makes a good consultant? What was it about Roger that made him not only an innovator in GIS, but also a good consultant? What drove Tomlinson Associates? And I have to say that my initial assumption in thinking about uh, consulting was that a good consultant is somebody who knows more than the client. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. What Roger had is something hidden in his bio, which I didn't draw attention to earlier, which is that he had significant experience as an actor. Roger physically was large. He was the sort of person who in Britain might well have become a Shakespearean actor, might well have played King Lear. He stood and towered over his clients. And in no uncertain terms, he, he bullied them. He told them what was right. And that made him an enormously effective consultant, something that I absolutely could not emulate. So what he promoted was what we would now, from, in hindsight, call the waterfall method. And it's described in a book that Esri Press published. This is the fifth edition in 2013. And it asked the following questions. So he and I would go to, for example, an office of the US Forest Service somewhere in Montana. We would assemble everyone in that office who was responsible for making decisions. And we'd ask them the following questions. What decisions do you have to make in your job? What geographic information would you need to make those decisions? What functions would be needed to perf be performed on raw data to create that information on which you can make decisions? What GIS vendors could provide those functions? And then finally, how well does that GIS vendor's software perform on the functions when, ex when submitted to a benchmark? And this, I think, was a very effective approach. It is very much an approach of the 1980s and 1990s. The waterfall method is now largely out of fashion, simply because technology has been advancing so rapidly. This rather lengthy, slow process is out of line with the nature of computing technology today. 
So I'd like to focus now then on the legacy of uh, what I see as Roger's contribution. And if we go back to CGIS, we can see that its essential input was maps. It, those maps were scanned and digitized. And underlying this is the assumption that the maps were the truth. That what was shown on the maps was a true representation of what happens in the real world. This was vector data, and we now know, after two decades of research, that it, there is no way of accommodating uncertainty in vector data. And I'll come back to that point in a moment. And furthermore, the maps we're working with, while prepared by experts, are not necessarily replicable. If you give the same task, let's say mapping soil suitability for agriculture, if you give the same task to two experts, they will not produce identical maps. So in a scientific sense, that mapping process is not replicable. So here's just an example. This happens to be a soil map of part of Afghanistan. And it's, I'm sure, unnecessary for me to point out that the lines shown on that map do not exist in reality. And we can argue about where a representation of the transition might be best placed, but fundamentally they don't exist. Two people would not agree on where to place the, the lines, how many polygons there should be, where the vertices should be, and the junctions of the polygons. So uncertainty was not part of the Tomlinson legacy. So today, however, after a lot of research, we do have some excellent methods for dealing with uncertainty. And I'd like to just take us down into the weeds a little bit here. But in terms of dealing with a map like this, we need to know, we need first to convert the map to a raster. For every cell in the raster, we need a set of probabilities. The probability that that cell is a member of type 1, type 2, type 3, etc. And we need a measure of the dependence in outcomes between neighboring cells because cells are not independent. If one cell turns out in reality to be class A, neighboring cells are more likely also to be class A. Where do the probabilities come from? How to express correlation? These are things that uh, we would need to go into a great deal more detail to address. But essentially, this is saying that the map is a realization of a statistical or stochastic process. And we can produce a range of maps depending on the assumptions that we make. So those two maps, in fact, have the same probabilities. What is different is the level of spatial dependence between neighboring cells. So a lot of work has been done on this, but I have to point out that this is not part of the Tomlinson legacy because basically CGIS regarded the map as the truth. The second aspect of the legacy is this, that the map is a metaphor for GIS, layers, and not the globe. So users of GIS need to be familiar with map projections because a map projection will always have been used in the database. And that is, then, map projections as ways of flattening the Earth, flattening the curved surface of the Earth. So we might look at something like this, which is very popular as what is often called a data cube, where the horizontal dimensions are the two geographic dimensions, and the vertical, in this case, is, is time, or it might be theme. But we're looking, essentially, at a GIS database as a stack of layers. So, unfortunately, because we've flattened the Earth, we often get into trouble. And let me just give you a quick example of how that happens. So here is an image that has come from satellite remote sensing. It's an image of the entire Earth's surface. The variable is sea surface temperature. And if you could look in detail at the top left, there is a note there that this is 50 kilometer resolution. But we have flattened the Earth. And so it is true only at the equator that this is a 50 kilometer resolution map. Only at the equator 
are those pixels 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers on the Earth's surface. Everywhere else, and particularly at high latitudes, the east-west dimension of a pixel has been reduced. So that across the bottom edge, for example, Antarctica has been smeared across the entire width of the Earth. And Greenland is shown wider than Africa, which of course is not. So we get into trouble, because in this case we've forgotten that we flattened the Earth in order to make this map. So 85 degrees north, for example, pixels are 50 kilometers north-south, but they're only 4.4 kilometers east-west. And this is part of a much bigger problem that we have all throughout the geospatial world when we have spatial units which are not constant across the Earth. Here are the United States counties. There are about 3,100 of them. And they vary in area by a factor of more than 100,000. Los Angeles County, California has a population of 10, over 10 million. Loving County, Texas has a population of less than 100. We've divided the world up into a way which makes it extremely difficult to do any serious scientific analysis because we have such variation in the basic spatial units. You often hear the phrase, the county level. Unfortunately, there's nothing level about the counties of the United States. There's another, though, challenge to this legacy, and that's this. Should we think of the world, should we think of a GIS database as a stack of pancakes, as we often do, or should we think about it in terms of peeling an onion? Because on the left-hand side, the stack of pancakes requires that the Earth be flattened. On the right-hand side, there's no need to flatten. We're working with a globe rather than a map. And in recent years, this idea of the globe as the basis for GIS rather than a map has received a lot of attention. And I want to talk just briefly about that, and then I'll wrap up. I was in the Anchorage uh, Museum in Alaska uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I went through an exhibit called Counter Cartography in, as one of the exhibits in that museum. And this is a room uh, devoted to an installation called World Processor by a German uh, artist Ingo Günther, and what he has done is taken globes, suspended them on the Earth. Some of them have north up, some of them have south up. They are different orientations, but they all, each of them, have a different theme around layered onto the Earth. Now, it's much easier to think about this as one onion with 50 layers than to think about needing to have 50 separate globes. But that's essentially what we get to if we think about the globe as the basis for GIS. So going beyond the Tomlinson legacy. Tomlinson's legacy was strictly based on maps. Here's what we could do with a globe-based GIS. We could build a digital Earth. And this, is, of course, is the basis for the International Society of Digital Earth and the journal. We could have a hierarchical system which gave spatial resolutions all the way from, let's say, 10 kilometers down to better than a meter. Think Google Earth, if you like. We have no break at the international dateline, no breaks at the poles, everything in latitude, longitude, projecting only in one circumstance, and that's when you want to see the Earth at once, the whole surface at once. That's the only time, in principle, you would need a map projection. Of course, you'd also have to project if you wanted to print the Earth onto a flat piece of paper. Distances measured over the Earth, geodesic distances then, and a discrete global grid system. And in the past few years, there have been some very significant advances in covering the Earth with tiles. In this case, the ball that we often use to hang in the middle of a dance floor. But more seriously, this one based on the octahedron, or this one based on the icosahedron. And then the third way, I think, in which we are going well beyond the Tomlinson legacy is GeoAI. And I'd suggest that there's really nothing in Roger's contribution 
which anticipates AI. Um, however, there have been some fairly early comments on, on GeoAI. Uh, for example, papers written by Jerry Dobson in the 1980s on what he called automated geography and the work of Stan Openshaw in the 1980s and some remarkable successes. But I think we would have to say at this point that the major successes of GeoAI are in classification, particularly in remote sensing, tasks like finding streets in aerial photographs, uh, finding social indicators by scanning the Street View database, and the task of searching for similar. Find me similar places on the Earth's surface, or find me similar places on the Moon, or find me similar suitable landing sites on the planet Mars. And here's a very early book on AI and geography, published in the 1990s uh, by Stan Openshaw and his wife, Christine Openshaw. So, how to wrap this up and how to um, bring all this to some takeaway points. Uh, number one, I fully endorse the notion that Roger Tomlinson was the true father of GIS. His vision, I think, was a very comprehensive vision. Always, to me, invites the question, who is the mother of GIS? And there's a, a serious uh, background to that question because it is very difficult to find any published, recognized contribution by women in the early days of GIS. Unfortunately, this was a male-dominated invention, a male-dominated uh, topic. Roger's legacy includes the idea of GIS and many aspects that are still true of GIS today. But in other ways, GIS practices have moved far beyond what he could have imagined in the 1960s and 1970s. Driven in part by advances in technology, in part by better understanding of the universal nature of Tomlinson's vision. Right? If you want to explain recent developments in GIS, I really believe that you can, you can still find bases for those ideas in the early days and Roger Tomlinson's work. I'd suggest that our vision today, though, is now one of geospatial infrastructure rather than the rather limited version of how GIS turned out. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I've been able to address some interesting points, and I hope I've given true honor to the memory of Roger Tomlinson. Thank you, Mike. That was amazing to see how we span 50 years uh, and what has remained the same and what has changed. Like, we used to scan maps. Now we are scanning the globe, the real thing. We don't need that intermediary media anymore. And by emphasizing the globe perspective, I think it's, it's clear that metaphors we take from maps are valuable, but they can be maybe too limiting some of the time. So it's great to take those lessons of what has remained, what has changed. Uh, and I think it was 2003, Mike, when you were uh, discussing in the predecessor of this conference, uh, GS about to go mainstream. And many of these developments very clearly are uh, the key factors, how to go from one single task, even though it is a very big task, and the task to some degree has remained the same, that we want to uh, look at the capacities and the potentials of our Earth and move that into so many other disciplines. Uh, I think there's a lesson, lot of lessons to be learned, and I'm sure there will be quite a few people in and beyond that room who would like to go back to your lecture. I hadn't come across the peeling of the onion before, but it's a great metaphor. So thank you again. <laughs> oh, you cannot yet leave. You still have to stay on. Oh, let me take this opportunity to thank Esri as well for facilitating this talk. And of course, as a small token of appreciation,